Thank you all for tuning into this Wilberforce Trusts webinar. As many of you will know, we usually host our annual Trust Litigation Day at this time of year at the Intercontinental Park Lane. But in light of the current restrictions, we're holding this event virtually. It is of course disappointing that we can't see you all in person this year, but we very much hope to resume normal service next time. We are however delighted to welcome so many of you today. I've been told we have attendees from the UK, Bermuda, BVI, Cayman, Nevis, Jersey, Guernsey, various places in Europe and other jurisdictions. Whilst webinars are not a substitute for meeting in person, there are some advantages. I heard an interesting statistic recently that the proportion of people who multitask whilst listening to a webinar is a whopping 93%. So whatever else you're doing at the moment, whether it be a lockdown yoga class, optimistically booking an Easter holiday, or just an audit of your inbox, I hope today's event is a useful accompaniment. The format of the event is that there will be two panel sessions and then some virtual networking, which will take place in breakout rooms of six, which will be shuffled every 10 minutes. Don't worry, I'll tell you more about the networking later on. In terms of housekeeping, please keep yourselves muted for now so that we can avoid background noise. There is a chat function so if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to send them in and we'll try to pick them up as we go along or alternatively answer them by email afterwards. We would recommend you to view the session in speaker view by clicking the button in the top right hand corner of your screen. So without further delay, let's move on to the first panel session for which my fellow panelists are Tiffany Scott QC, Edward Sawyer and Joseph Stedman all of whom are members of Wilberforce and have busy trust practices. The title of the first panel session is Now You See Me, Now You Don't, The Disappearing Trust. The immediate prompt for this topic is the recent Privy Council decision of Webb and Webb. Interestingly, the Webb decision hasn't received as much publicity or comment as one might have expected. That may be because judgment was handed down in early August of last year, or perhaps because of the pandemic more generally, people simply haven't had the chance to consider fully its implications. And you might compare that with the Pugachev decision back in 2017, which did generate a lot of discussion and comment at the time. During today's session, our esteemed panel members are going to consider how the decision in Webb sits with Pugachev and more generally the concept of the so-called illusory trust. I should note that uh, Miss Justice Burst, the judge in Pugachev, didn't actually like the term illusory trust. He spoke instead of the true effects of the trust claim. Now this line of cases addresses of course an extremely important area because it goes to the very root of what a trust is, what a proper trustee relationship entails, and whether the irreducible core of trustee duties has been respected. It also raises the question whether the development of the modern extremely wide discretionary trust has gone too far. These considerations are naturally important for both those devising or preparing trust structures and also for those seeking to attack or defend them. Now, before handing over to the panelists, I want to carry out a very quick poll relating to people's experiences in this area. Now, the simple question for the poll, which hopefully you'll see on your screens, is have you ever come across a trust deed which has made you wonder whether the set law has reserved too many powers or too much control so as to call into question the validity of the trust. You should be able to see the poll on your screen. Please select uh, your answer, yes or no. There's no option to sit on the fence. You can't say you can't remember or can't be bothered. I'll give just a few seconds before we see the results. It might be said that the answer to this question could be quite revealing about the kinds of clients that you've had to advise or represent during your practice. Ah, well, that's, uh, that's interesting. I hope everyone can see 78% uh, have said yes. And um, I think that probably goes to show how, an import, how important a topic this is, mm -hmm. and that it is one which many of you may well have to consider again in the future. Now, I've mentioned Web and Web. Let's start by considering what that case was about. Tiffany, why don't you kick us off? Yes, so uh, it's a claim that started off in the Cook Islands and it ended up in the Privy Council. 
And the claim was about trust issues that arose on the breakdown of a marriage between Mr. and Mrs. Webb. They'd got married in New Zealand and had a daughter. Uh, Mr. Webb already had a son. And after the marriage, uh, he established a trust for himself and for his son. And that trust acquired property in the Cook Islands where the family lived for a time before Mr. and Mrs. Webb sadly separated. Uh, Mr. Webb returned to New Zealand uh, with his son where he faced a very substantial tax liability that had accrued over a number of years. Uh, and he set up a new trust and he arranged for the Cook Islands Trust to transfer assets to that trust for nominal consideration. And uh, matrimonial proceedings ensued, as you can imagine, uh, in the Cook Islands. And Mrs. Webb contended, first of all, that Mr. Webb's tax liability should not be brought into account on their divorce. And secondly, uh, more importantly for our purposes, she argued that the two trusts were invalid. And she lost her claim at first instance, but she succeeded in the Cook Islands Court of Appeal, which said, first of all, that this tax liability in New Zealand should not be brought into account because it wouldn't be enforceable in the Cook Islands. And the Privy Council agreed with that, although uh, Lord Wilson dissented. Uh, but more importantly, the Court of Appeal uh, held that the two trusts were invalid. So Mr. Webb appealed to the, the Privy Council, which upheld the judgment of the Court of Appeal in the Cook Islands. Now, most of the judgment is taken up with the decision about this uh, tax liability. In relation to the trust, it's fair to say that there's not uh, a, a great deal of depth to the Privy Council's analysis. Um, ultimately, it held that Mr. Webb's powers under each of the trust deeds were such that in equity and in all of the circumstances of the case, he could be regarded as having rights in the trust assets which were indistinguishable from ownership. So that was, that was the, uh, the main point. And uh, the Privy Council reached that conclusion because Mr. Webb was not only the set law, but he was also a trustee, he was consultant, so he had the role of advising the trustees, and he was also a beneficiary of the trust along with his son. And it was said that uh, he had the power at any time to secure the benefit of all of the trust property to himself and to do so regardless of the interests of the other beneficiary. So the Privy Council endorsed the Cook Islands uh, Court of Appeals conclusion that in those circumstances, this, the trust deeds failed to record an effective alienation of uh, any of the trust property. And so it was said the trusts were therefore invalid. Now, there was a subsidiary point. Um, the Cook Islands Court of Appeal and the Court of First Instance uh, both found that the trusts were not shams. It had been argued that they were, but they weren't. And the Privy Council endorsed that conclusion too. Thank you, uh, Tiffany. It does sound like there were some similarities between Webb and the Pugachev decision. Joe, can you remind us all what Pugachev was about? Absolutely. This takes us back to October 2017. You might think happier times before we had uh, all heard of coronavirus, social distancing, and we're worrying about getting our vaccinations on time. Um, Sergei Pugachev was the founder of the Mezprom Bank and he was heavily involved in Russian politics, including the political rise of Vladimir Putin. Unfortunately for him, around the time of the global financial crisis in 2008, Mr Pugachev fell out of favour with the Russian elite and around the same time the bank became insolvent and Mr Pugachev was accused of misappropriating huge sums of money from it. An issue arose, however, when it came to the bank seeking to recover that money. Because Mr. Pugachev had settled assets on trusts, including very valuable London property, um, he said his creditors uh, could not get access to the money. Or at least he purported to settle those assets on trusts. These supposed trusts were New Zealand-based discretionary trusts, of which Mr. Pugachev and his family were among the discretionary beneficiaries, and of which Mr. Pugachev was the protector. As protector, Mr. Pugachev had extensive powers. He could add people to the pool of discretionary beneficiaries. He could add a new protector. He could add trustees or remove them with or without cause. He also, as protector, could veto the exercise of many key powers by the trustees, including the distribution of income or capital, uh, the investment of the trust fund, the removal of beneficiaries, the variation of the trust deed, and the release or revocation of trustee powers. So pretty extensive, and for good measure, he also had a right to reside in the London property, um, and, and he in fact did so. The result of all of this, Mr Justice Burse found in the High Court, 
was that on their own terms, the trusts didn't divest Mr. Pugachev of the beneficial ownership he had of the assets he'd transferred into them. In substance, Mr. Justice Burst said, they allowed Mr. Pugachev to retain effective control of the assets, and therefore uh, he had retained his beneficial ownership of the property. The combination of the powers he had meant that he could prevent the trustees from distributing the assets to anyone else, and he could remove rec recalcitrant trustees uh, in favour of stu stooges who would do his bidding. In other words, he had effectively retained complete control. And so the trusts were, as the claimants said, illusory. Thank you, Joe. Uh, many of us will recall that there was quite a lot of criticism of the uh, Pugach decision at the time. Its reasoning was said to be a heresy and Mr. Justice Burse misunderstood or misapplied conventional trust law. So, Edward, do you think the Webb decision has in fact vindicated the approach in Pugachev? Um, thanks, Andrew. Well, the striking thing is that the Webb judgment doesn't refer to Pugachev at all. So the Pugachev approach is not expressly approved by the Privy Council in Webb. However, the analysis in both Pugachev and Webb originates from the same source, which is an earlier decision of the New Zealand Supreme Court in a case called Clayton and Clayton. Clayton recognised that it was arguable that you can have a purported trust where there is a settlor who's also beneficiary and trustee who has such wide powers that the trust is invalid. The concept identified in Clayton was that you can have an apparent trust where even though the trustee has an obligation to act in good faith, the powers given to the trustee who's also the beneficiary and settlor are so broad that the trustee can basically do whatever he wants with the property. So in other words, Clayton said that if on an objective construction of the powers under the trustee, the trustee slash beneficiary slash settlor could apply the property in his own favour without realistic constraint, then arguably no valid trust came into existence. And in Webb and Webb, the Privy Council referred to Clayton and adopted essentially the same approach. They carried out an objective analysis of the powers under the trust deed and asked themselves if Mr. Webb, who was the settlor and also beneficiary and trustee, could exercise his powers to secure the benefit of the trust property to himself. And they thought that he could do so and therefore the trust was invalid. Now, despite the fact that the Privy Council in Webb didn't refer to Pugachev, it would seem that Webb adopted essentially the same analysis as Mr. Justice Burse had in Pugachev. In Pugachev, the analysis was also based on Clayton and Clayton, and the judge uh, held that the correct approach was to construe the powers and duties under the trust deed objectively, um, and to work out the true effect of the trust, and to see whether Mr. Pugachev as settlor had complete control of the trusts. So ultimately, it seems likely that Webb and Webb will be regarded in future as being supportive of the Pugachev approach. It's also noticeable that in Webb, the Privy Council essentially upheld the reasoning of the Cook Islands Court of Appeal. And if you turn to the, to the Court of Appeal judgment, you'll see that it cites Pugachev and describes it as illuminating the principle to be applied. That said, there are limits to the extent to which um, Pugachev is supported by Webb. Um, whereas both Webb and Clayton were cases where the settlor was also the sole trustee with power to benefit himself, in contrast, in Pugachev, as you've heard, the settlor wasn't the trustee, and indeed the trustee's fiduciary duties weren't abridged under the Pugachev trust deed, but the court got round that because Mr. Pugachev had beneficial power to remove the trustee and appoint new ones. And as Joe has explained, the judge concluded that uh, he could effectively ignore the powers of the trustee um, on the footing that he could be removed and Mr. Pugachev could get a stooge to transfer the whole trust property to him. Now, that particular aspect, which is perhaps the most controversial of Mr. Justice Burse's reasoning in Pugachev, um, isn't touched upon by the Webb judgment and it doesn't provide any support for it. So whilst the general principles applied in Pugachev may be said to be supported by the Privy Council in Webb, there's scope to argue that the very far reaching application of the principles to the facts in Pugachev is not supported by Webb. And indeed the fact that the Privy Council in Webb didn't refer to Pugachev 
may betray some reservations about the approach adopted in Pugachev. Uh, thank you, Edward. So it seems that the criticism of Miss Justice Burse at the time was perhaps overblown, although some elements of his reasoning are still open to doubt. In particular, to the extent that his reasoning relies on Mr. Pugachev being able to find a trustee who would ignore his or her fiduciary duties, this appears unconvincing. And this may be an important point of distinction um, in the future. Tiffany, doesn't this area also raise the relationship between powers and property and the TMSF decision um, on appeal to the Privy Council from the Cayman Court of Appeal a few years back? Yes, exactly. It is strange that the Privy Council didn't refer to Pugachev, but they did refer to TMSF, the un unpronounceable Tassaroof against uh, Merrill Lynch, a 2011 decision uh, also of the Privy Council, in which it was said that it had long been recognised that a completely general power of appointment, so one where the holder can appoint the property to himself, uh, may be tantamount to ownership. So TMSF was about trust in the Cayman Islands, of which the settler and his family were discretionary beneficiaries. Um, and in respect of which the settle had a power of revocation uh, and the claimant was a judgment creditor and it wanted to appoint a receiver to get at that power of revocation and to reach the funds that were in the trusts. Uh, and the issue was whether that power of revocation was a property right that the settler could be required to delegate to the receivers. And the Privy Council said yes, that power was such that in equity the settler had rights that were tantamount to ownership it was said that the power couldn't be regarded as a fiduciary power, and the only discretion that the settler had was whether to exercise it in his own favour. Um, and so the power was regarded as being property, it was delegable or assignable, and uh, the settler had to assign it to the receivers. And it's interesting that the basis for the decision then in TMSF was that the power of revocation was itself tantamount to ownership of the underlying property, not that it was actually ownership of the underlying property. But on that reasoning, until the exercise of the power, it would seem that the trust ought to be regarded as valid, not invalid, as was the case in Webb. So while the decision in TMSF doesn't actually go so far as to decide whether a trust is valid before this power of revocation is exercised, that must have been the position because if the trust weren't valid in the first place, there wouldn't be a power that existed um, as property that was capable of being assigned to the receivers. So that's clearly a, a conceptually different exercise from the exercise that was uh, being carried out in web of declaring the trust to be invalid and it was invalid because there hadn't been an effective alienation of the underlying property by the wannabe settle law in web. Um, as an aside, while we're on the subject of receivers, I had a matrimonial case recently where these issues came into play. It was a slightly different context. Um, the wife was arguing that assets held in trust for the husband were a resource that was available to him and should be included in the divorce. Uh, the trustees had the power during the husband's lifetime to pay a proportion of his capital entitlement to him. Uh, and he was vehemently against the suggestion that he should be making a request of the trustees to pay him capital to discharge any liability he might have to his wife. Um, so the question arose, well, by whom could such a request be made of the trustees and what would be the effect of that? So the wife was asking the court to consider ordering the husband to make a request of the trustees to pay him a capital sum, or else she wanted the court to appoint a receiver over his power to make a request of the trustees. And she cited a case called Blight and Brewster from 2012 in support of that. Uh, and that's a case where a judgment creditor wanted to get at the assets in a pension scheme that was held for the judgment debtor. And the court relied on section 37 of the Senior Courts Act to order the judgment debtor to sign a letter that was to be presented to him to delegate that power that he had um, to request a tax-free payment from his pension. Uh, and the judge was relying in that case on TMSF. But obviously, uh, and importantly, under the pension scheme, the husband had an absolute entitlement to draw down 25% of his pension as a tax-free lump sum. So the court made the order in that case. But in my case, uh, the wife wanted the court to exercise its discretion in a similar way, but the husband said, well, the court doesn't have jurisdiction to make that order. Um, it would represent a radical extension of the law. The husband didn't have a relevant power or an asset or an interest in property to which uh, a receivership order could attach. Uh, and his ability to request a capital distribution from the trustees was clearer, it, clearly, it was said, of inferior status to a general power appointment. Or power of revocation. 
So, and ultimately, frustratingly, the court didn't have to decide that point in our case because um, it was held that the wife was not to have a capital distribution, but she would have lump sum payments from his uh, income. So it wasn't ultimately decided. Thank you, uh, Tiffany. It is interesting that your own experience of this issue is from the matrimonial context, just like Clayton and also like Webb. Um, it does, of course, make one wonder how much the context in which these issues arise will impact on the outcome, even leaving aside uh, statutory intervention and extended concepts of property and settlements. So um, trying to bring the threads together, Joe, uh, what do you think is the current state of the law? Well, I think it's, it's interesting that you talk about a matrimonial context, because I think the situation we've ended up in is that context ends up being everything. Let's think back to Pugachev. It's possible to see that decision as an application of established trust law principles. We all know that the creation and effect of a trust depends on objective rather than subjective intention, and that using a trust label, sticking the words declaration of trust at the top of your document, is neither necessary nor sufficient to establish that intention. So you can label something a trust and uh, end up not managing to create one, and likewise you can uh, create a trust without without saying that you have. But the question is, uh, and the question is whether an arrangement has been created that has the necessary features of a trust. Uh, Mr. Justice Burson Pugachev found that um, his arrangements didn't. What isn't particularly clear though, is which of those necessary features was missing from Mr. Pugachev's trusts. It's not enough for Mr. Justice Burst to say he'd failed to divest himself of his beneficial ownership because that's just stating the conclusion that he hadn't created a trust. Nor can it be right that in every case where the set law is able to exert pressure on the trustees to do his bidding, that this will invalidate a trust. Trustees are generally required to have regard to the set law's wishes and will often completely legitimately end up exercising their powers in accordance with those wishes. An example of that from a, an everyday context is, uh, is pensions where you have a, a death benefit and you'll leave a, a nomination form for your um, trustees to consider and by and large they'll end up following that and I think you'd be quite cross actually if you um, if it turned out after your death you know your um, partner didn't receive um, the assets that you'd said they should receive. The risk here then is that as a result the context prevails over everything else and judges attempted to invalidate trusts in order to reach what they consider to be the right answer. So in the, in the context of a pension death benefit, everyone's happy that you should be able to put that into a trust and have it paid to the person you want. But there's a sense that in some of the decisions, judges using, are using reasons external to trusts law, important principles like protecting creditors and providing for spouses, as a justification for saying that something isn't right as a matter of trusts law itself. And there are a couple of problems with that. Uh, undoubtedly there are more, but here are, here are two. Um, the first is lack of certainty. How can you know as a set law or as a trustee if what's been created is a trust? And does it stop being a trust if you do something the courts won't like? Ultimately, that ends up being a question about how the trust will stand up to litigation. But if we don't know what it is that made Mr. Pugachev's trust, or indeed Mr. Webb's trust, um, quite so uh, objectionable, then we can't answer that question. The second is that it leads to a lack of principle. The law has mechanisms for addressing the non-trust law concerns that these sorts of cases deal with, and they include important safeguards, which it might be thought claimants shouldn't simply be able to sidestep. Pugach has an example here. Uh, Section 423 of the Insolvency Act was pleaded in the alternative, transactions to fraud and creditors. But Mr. Justice Burst didn't have to deal with that and with the more stringent intentionality requirements which would have applied in that context because he found the trust illusory from the very beginning. Good for the claimants. Similarly, there are powers under the Matrimonial Causes Act to avoid dispositions or very nuptial settlements and they're again subject to limitations which might be disregarded if you can plead an illusory trust. And Tiffany's case is an example of those limitations coming into play um, where the court say, well, no, I haven't got jurisdiction um, 
But if, if the claimants in that case had succeeded on an illusory trust argument, um, the court wouldn't have had to deal with those questions, those limitations. So it's difficult to discern from the decisions we've talked about today what pushed these particular trusts over the line. And so it's easy to understand why commentators have worried when the starting point of the analysis in Pugachev, for example, is to posit a hypothetical, unscrupulous person creating a trust, that the remedial tail was wagging the doctrinal dog. Thank you, Joe. Um, so apart from not being, or at least uh, not coming across as an unscrupulous person, what about some practical examples? Edward, are there particular features which we can say should in practice raise alarm bells? And are there others that should be safe? Well, um, looked at in isolation, many of the features of the trusts in the illusory trust cases would be unobjectionable. For example, in isolation, a reserved power to revoke a trust doesn't invalidate the trust. And you heard about that when Tiffany referred to the TMSF case earlier. Similarly, by itself, there's nothing wrong with the reserved power for a settlor to appoint or remove trustees. And by itself, there's nothing wrong with the reserved power for a settlor to direct investments or to add or exclude beneficiaries. Similarly, clauses abridging a trustee's fiduciary duties, authorizing him to benefit as a beneficiary, um, are unobjection unobjectionable and obviously a settlor can be the sole trustee or, or one of the trustees. So looked at in isolation, those are fine. The danger arises where you have several of these powers rolled up together. And you can see this when you look at what has fallen foul of the illusory trust concept in the Webb, Pugachev and arguably at least in the Clayton cases that we've been talking about. So Webb, Webb, Pugachev and Clayton were all discretionary trusts where the settlor was a beneficiary. In all three, the settlor also had extensive protector type powers. In Webb and Clayton, it was clear the settlor could obtain the benefit of all the trust property because in both cases, the settlor was the sole trustee. In both cases, there were clauses uh, enabling a trustee to benefit from his exercise of powers. And in both cases, the settlor had non-fiduciary powers, enabling him to constitute himself as the sole beneficiary. As you've heard, Pugachev was different in that the settlor wasn't a trustee, um, but the judge said he had a power to remove the trustee, which could be used to put in place uh, someone who would transfer the trust property to him. So looking at all three cases, a critical feature is that the settlor controlled the powers of the trustee, either being the sole trustee or having a power to remove and appoint the trustee, which was a non-fiduciary power. And another critical feature of the three cases was that the settlor was a beneficiary with power to exclude other beneficiaries or prevent dispositions except to himself, so that in effect he re could require the trust property to be transferred to himself. So those are obvious red flags to look out for. Um, and so you should be concerned where you have cases in which the settlor is the sole trustee and is a beneficiary and has he has vested in him beneficial dispositive powers so that the whole trust fund can be applied in his favour. Or uh, there's a third party trustee, but the settlor has a non fiduciary power to remove him. So the lesson from the cases is that where it's desired to establish a trust with significant powers reserved to the settlor, who is also a beneficiary, it would be prudent to have additional trustees um, and the step standard provisions, for example, provide for an independent trustee uh, where um, a trustee is authorized to benefit under the trust. So that's a good example. And in addition, to make um, any power to appoint or remove trustees a fiduciary one, which would um, challenge the, the judge's way around the problem in, in Pugachev. So the upshot of all of this is that the illusory trust cases do create a lot of uncertainty, as, as Joe has said. The cases tell you what is impermissible, namely a supposed trust where the settlor has reserved such broad powers that he's not parted with beneficial ownership. But they don't provide you with any clear guidance on what reservation of powers is excessive. So we're left with the, the old elephant test where the judge knows what an elephant is, 
when he sees it, but he doesn't provide us with a definition of what an elephant is, an elephant is, which is pretty unsatisfactory. Um, thank you, Edward. I'm sure it's a failing on my part as chair that I've allowed the discussion to move on to talking about first dogs with Joe and now elephants with Edward. However, the final point I want to raise is about the effect of specific trust legislation in some jurisdictions. Um, Joe, how do you think the, this type of legislation fits into the debate? Well, I promise not to use any more animal analogies. I'm not sure what escalates from dog to elephant to something even bigger. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll avoid that. I mean, legislative intervention is something that certainly fed into the commentary around uh, Pukachev once that decision came out. There was a whole series of articles following the Pukachev decision where practitioners in different jurisdictions said things along the lines of, what if Mr. Pugachev had set up his trust in my jurisdiction? Um, several of those have enacted reserve powers legislation, but importantly not New Zealand, unfortunately for Mr. Pugachev, or the Cook Islands, unfortunately for Mr. Webb. Um, some of the jurisdictions that do have this legislation include the Bahamas, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Guernsey, Jersey, Gibraltar, the Isle of Man, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Um, if you're from another jurisdiction that, that has some um, reserve powers legislation, um, I'd love to hear about your, your reserve powers legislation too. Um, the objective of this sort of legislation is to restrict the scope for challenge to the validity of the trust on the basis that the settlor has reserved excessive powers to control the trustees by the express terms of the trust instrument, or has conferred those powers upon uh, the protector who ordinarily is uh, thought of as the settlor's right-hand man. Um, and the question I suppose for us is, do these legislative interventions give settlers carte blanche to return, to reserve whatever powers they like? Um, I've got three things to say about that. The first thing to note is that often there hasn't been time for these, these legislative interventions to be tested by the courts. Um, Although some of this, this stuff has been around for quite a while, it's constantly being updated uh, to try and keep ahead of, of new developments. And so as lawyers, we can consider the leg legislative wording and do our best to work out its consequences. But ultimately, no matter how much we'd like to think otherwise and tell our clients otherwise, we can't be 100% sure how judges would apply the legislation in a given factual scenario, especially a factual scenario that will be complex. And that takes me on to the second thing to note. The legislative wording differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And in some cases it is, or at least in the past, has been pretty open textured. So at one end of the spectrum, we have the uh, Bermuda situation before 2014. And before 2014, the Bermudan law said uh, the reservation by the settler of certain rights and powers and the fact that the trustee may have rights as a beneficiary are not necessarily inconsistent with the existence of a trust. And so as trust practitioners, we were left unclear about which rights and powers we're talking about, certain rights, who knows, um, and about which circumstances would make the res reservation of powers consistent or inconsistent with the existence of a trust. And then at the other end of the spectrum, um, and just taking one example, there are, there are others with, with stronger laws, uh, you've got the Cayman Islands, where there's a list of powers or categories of powers and the legislation says emphatically um, that res reserving those powers shall not invalidate the trust. That's much less equiv equivocal than the Bermuda legislation, but with precision comes the capacity for things to fall through the gaps. So on the one hand, you might have a, a power or a category of powers um, that isn't provided for. And on the other hand, you might have um, legislation which only says the reserve powers won't invalidate the trust, leaving open the possibility that they might change its nature, for example, from a discretionary trust with a, an open uh, class of beneficiaries to a fixed interest trust in favour of the settler himself. And that leads me on to the post-2014 position in Bermuda. Um, now, the legislation says, without prejudice to the generality of the original provision, there's a list of powers or categories of powers and a provision that it won't invalidate the trust or, importantly, prevent it from taking effect in accordance with its terms. Even here, though, there might be legislative cracks to probe. For example, one reading of Pugachev is that the trust did take effect according to its terms. It's just that the true effect of those terms was to give effective control to Mr. Pugachev. 
The powers or categories of powers also differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So in the British Virgin Islands, for example, there's no express reference to powers of revocation or amendment, but those might be implicitly covered by the catch-all wording without limitation to the foregoing. Again, something that would require testing before a court. Also worth considering is a completely different approach taken in Hong Kong and Singapore. In those jurisdictions, the legislative protection applies only to powers relating to the investment of the trust fund and the management of the trust assets, but not to distributive powers. So a settler trying to set up a trust in those jurisdictions doesn't benefit from the um, reserve powers legislation in respect of um, controlling the assets in the same way as they might in other jurisdictions. And in other words, settlers need to choose their jurisdictions carefully if they want to reserve these sorts of powers because some will be more accommodating than others. Talk of different jurisdictions takes me on to the third thing to note, which is external threats. Legislative interventions in a trust's home jurisdiction might not be worth the paper they're written on if a court in another jurisdiction, particularly one where trust assets are held, is prepared to disregard them. Firewall legislation might help here depending on the jurisdiction, uh, depending on whether it has firewall legislation and depending on its terms. But let's assume there is no firewall or there's a gap in the firewall for some reason. Then a foreign judge, let's say an English judge, might have various tools at their disposal. They might still be able to use the doctrine of sham, for example, because that's not based solely on the existence of excessive powers in the trust instrument. Rather, it's based on a shared subjective intention, which differs from that expressed in the trust instrument. And more concerningly to a settler of this kind of trust, various areas of the law permit its departure from the strictures of what trust law has to say about validity. So reserve powers might make trust assets a resource for the purposes of a matrimonial claim without invalidating the trust, or they might make, uh, make those trust assets property for the purposes of an insolvency claim or make them subject to taxation. So those three very quick points should, I think, give settlers pause for thought before simply reserving as many powers as they can. They should think about the points Edwards raised because these legislative interventions are not a panacea. Much better for the settler to feel comfortable that their trust would be valid as a matter of general trusts law and to rely on the legislative interventions as a fallback than to find possibly decades down the line that the legislation doesn't do quite what they hoped for. Thank you, Joe. So depending on its terms and where the trust assets are located, local legislation may not be the complete answer. We're almost out of time for this first session, but I want to pick up a quick question from the chat. And we've had a question which is, do these decisions raise or lower the bar for establishing sham trusts? Uh, Tiffany, Joe, perhaps, perhaps you've got a view on this. Yeah, I don't think these decisions help us very much on um, whether the bar is raised or lowered for establishing sham trusts. I think we're dealing with uh, different things. And as I, I mentioned earlier, the Privy Council in Webb um, upheld the decision of the, the first instance courts that uh, Mr. Webb didn't have a sham intention, but went on to decide the case um, on the different um, principles of illusory trusts. So with sham, you're dealing with a pretense, uh, a, a, a wanting to give a false appearance, wanting to mislead um, uh, in the creation of a trust. But um, when you're dealing with the illusory trust concepts, um, you've just, you've intended to create a trust genuinely, but you haven't managed to do it properly and you haven't divested yourself of your interest um, in, the, in the underlying assets. So these cases don't, I think, take us much further, but I don't know whether Joe's got more to add to that. Yeah, well, I don't think they take us further in terms of changing the test for a sham, but I think what they do is potentially give claimants a route around the strictures of the sham doctrine. So, uh, Tiffany, as you say, um, you have to prove subjective intentions, which are quite uh, quite difficult to show, and which judges are going to be um, be quite reluctant to find, particularly when sham starts to shade into fraud. Um, whereas, in in the situation where you're pleading an illusory trust, you don't actually need necessarily any factual evidence at all to go your way because you just say look at the words on the page 
unfortunately for everyone involved who wanted this to be a trust, they just haven't quite managed to create one. It's actually a, a nice route around um, the sham doctrine. Great. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to bring things to a close there on this first panel session. Uh, it's on an interesting topic that I'm sure will be addressed in more detail by the courts at some point. I've seen that there's been another question in chat function. Um, one or other of the panel members will try and follow that up and um, give a response by way of email. So I'm now going to hand over to Fenna, who's going to introduce the second panel session. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, can I just ask my panel to uh, bring their video up? And uh, yes, Andrew, to turn your video off, if you would. OK, so before we kick off, I just want to introduce my panel. First off, we are incredibly pleased to welcome Daniel Hall to join us today. Uh, the headline point about Dan is that he's a director of Burford Capital, the extremely well-known leading litigation funder. He's also the co-lead of Burford's global corporate intelligent asset tracing and enforcement business, i.e. naughty people chasing business, which, I mean, purely incidentally, is how I first met him. Basically, if you're chasing a fraudster, you really want Dan on your side. However, and this is uh, somewhat unusual, despite his expertise in the funding world, Dan's background is actually from within the legal professions. He got a law degree from Oxford, and then he qualified and practiced as a solicitor with Stevens and Harwood, London, Hong Kong. It was only after a few years of being a solicitor that he actually moved to the commercial investigations and risk management industry. And then, then he spent about a decade investigating fraud and financial crime before setting up his own business, Focus Intelligence, which was then bought up by Burford Capital about five years ago, bringing up to today. The point about this is, is essentially Dan has a lot more experience of all the moving parts of litigation, all the practical elements than your standard funder, which is why I'm particularly happy to have him with us today. Next up, we have Gilead Cooper, Queen's Council, uh, and Jamie Holmes. Um, look, uh, as Andrew said, they both have very busy trust practices. Uh, you don't want to hear about us. What you really want to do is get straight onto the topic today. And the topic for our panel session, our second panel session today, is all about trusts and costs, trust, trustees and costs. We've got a few topics to cover today. The main one is uh, the issue of litigation funding, but we're going to fill in at the end with three relatively small and discrete issues. This is a Tuesday afternoon, it's 5.45. We thought we'd give you a few points that we thought you might not have come across in practice or thought about in practice. But the big one, the starting topic, is an interesting and genuinely developing issue for our field, which is litigation funding. And just to kick off the process, I'm gonna start with the first question of the session for all of us. Uh, question one, if we can bring that up on the screen, have you ever acted in a trust dispute with litigation funding? And there are four possible answers. Yes, there was a trustee that had funding. Yes, there was a beneficiary that had funding. Yes, there were both beneficiaries and trustees who had funding. And just blankly, no, no, I haven't. Um, and by trust disputes in this case, uh, what I mean is a dispute about trusts, about the existence of them, about who the beneficiaries or the trusts are, not just a dispute where a trust happened to be involved. Now, I don't know for sure but I pretty strongly suspect that the answer to these questions is gonna be that most people have not experienced litigation funding in trust disputes, which is a bit odd because how you pay for good cases when the client is cash poor is a perennial problem. Uh, recently, we've had the Lex Law decision in the Court of Appeal just last week, confirming that uh, damages-based agreements do work even when your client cancels them at the last moment which is nice to know eight years after they came into existence. But all it does is highlight issues that might arise in trust litigation, which I'm gonna come back to in a second. So if we can just have the answers to that, yeah, 77% have not had any sort of experience in trust dispute with litigation funding. And of those, all that we've really got is a few, 13% beneficiary, 9% trustee. So if we aren't doing funding arrangements in trust litigation, the next question is this, is there simply no interest. So question two, if it was available, would litigation funding be interesting to you in your practice in relation to trust disputes? A possible answer is no, not at all. Yes, sometimes. Yes, often. Yes, at all. Now, obviously here at this point, I'm hoping that the answers will be that at least some of you find this vaguely interesting. But on that assumption, and we'll keep the, quest, the poll rolling for a few seconds now, on that assumption, why isn't this happening? 
what are the complications that trust that, that litigation funding in trust litigation in trust litigation raises and how can we address those issues to get to a solution so if we can have the answers to that okay yeah sometimes 72 percent of people 18 percent often not five percent only five percent of people wouldn't be interested in funding so thank god for that because that actually makes this topic vaguely interesting so let's start with and, and obviously you've got trust funding litigation for trustees and funding for beneficiaries let's start with funding for trustees because when i came to this i kind of in my head thought of it in a beneficiary based way it might be my practice but that was how i saw it but also i kind of assumed that trustees have a trust fund to draw on and of course that's not always the case as dan has found out in one of his cases and dan can you tell us a little about a little about your trustee funding case, maybe start with why these trustees were looking for funding, given that they were ostensibly trustees of a trust fund. Sure. And Fenner, thanks ever so much for the kind introduction. There is no way I can ever live up to that billing, so I appreciate you setting me up to fail. Um, yeah, so, so we've been involved in a, in a couple of different trusts matters with funding. I'm gonna have to be slightly guarded in some of the things I say for obvious reasons, some of them are still live. And there may even be a small chance one of the protagonists and one of them may have dialed into this conference. Um, but yeah, so, so we looked at a couple of things for trustees first. Um, I suppose I can take you through the examples there and, I, and why the trustees have come to us, why litigation funding they perceive as appropriate there, and why we at Burford thought it was an interesting and potentially investable opportunity when, when weighing up the different commercial risks. Um, one case I looked at was kind of emanating from a central European country, civil law, where it was in the context of the enforcement of an arbitral award. So you mentioned my background is doing a lot of asset recovery work. This is when lawyers I know and work with a lot came to me and said, look, one of the things we've managed to do is successfully enforce an arbitral award against, you know, Mr. X, a bad guy. And one of the things he had was a right as protector over a trust structure, which in turn owned a pretty large kind of corpus of assets. And what had happened as part of the legal proceedings to date was that in seizing his right as protector to amongst other things appoint trustees, the award creditor in the circumstance appointed a new set of trustees who were the ones that the creditor believed was gonna be in de facto control of the trust structure. Now this didn't go down too well with the award debtor, and so you're in a rather odd scenario where the dispute was technically funding some trustees, but the, the real kind of merit of the dispute was who was the correct group of trustees that should be allowed to administer this trust. Obviously, the, the fresh set that had been installed by the award creditor didn't easily have access to the corpus of the trust in that circumstance. So, you know, it, it, was, it was them that required the funding. And one of the things we were looking at and assessing was whether or not we felt they had the correct standing, the legal process had been applied correctly, that, you know, this mechanism of installing new trustees was, was something that was going to stand all the different appellate levels in this particular country. Um, and it's something we've been, we've been looking at and funding there. So it, it's, it's a bit of an odd, very kind of fact specific scenario, but that's one example where we've managed to, to fund a group of trustees in that scenario. Um, another matter is where there was a, a, a trust structure being managed by, by a variety of trustees. Um, there were disagreements at the beneficiary level. Um, one, of the, one of the things that happened is some one group of beneficiaries essentially managed to uh, suborn or abscond with a, a, a part of the trust structure of the trust assets. And the trustees were in a position where they felt that if they did not take any action, they could in theory be subject to uh, liability in the future from heirs and heiresses from, from, the, from the original trust. Uh, but at the same time, there were other impediments in place that I probably can't go into too deeply now as to why they couldn't use the remainder of the corpus of the trust to fund it. Um, and so, yeah, there, there was a, kind of a bit of a beauty parade, to be honest with you, different funders were approached. Um, and we, we were the ones that successfully managed to enter into a funding arrangement with the trustees um, and, and be kind of get underway and help them in their, in their multi-jurisdictional dispute. And that's, that's covered quite a lot of different jurisdictions in that one. Well, thanks for that, Dan. Um, 
So you've got two different varieties of situations, but essentially you've got trustees or at least putative trustees uh, with assets that at the end of the day, if they win, they're going to be in control of. Now, on a practical basis, how to structure that deal doesn't seem wildly complicated. Your definition of success is going to be how do you have you got control of these assets? Yep. Uh, your recovery issue is going to be built into the price. Slightly more complicated is going to be all those legal issues that hover around chancery litigation. Is there any way in particular that you could, you can, or you did, or you would deal with legal risk in this unusual and novel area? Well, frankly, it's not that different to funding a traditional piece of international arbitration or high court litigation. I mean, what will you have, fortunately, as we see on, on not just this panel, but many of the, um, the people who've joined this talk, you know, a wide array of legal expertise, at least in the London market and elsewhere, where you can turn to and get a view as to the prospects, prospects of success. And after that, it really just becomes a question of pricing for the funder. As you say, we are relatively happy from a kind of diligence perspective on the clients, the merits of the claim, the underlying economics, and really to the extent you perceive risk or bumps in the road, and that can be, you know, jurisdictional, it can be duration, it can be other things, you just have to price that accordingly. Um, you know, the game we're in, we will lose some investments that we take on, but obviously the business is trying to win more than you lose in considerably so. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, it's, it's particularly interesting on, on the fact that you're really just taking a commercial view of this in, in a way that I wouldn't say glosses over, but just absorbs the legal issues that lawyers yeah. might get hung up on effectively. And if you can come down to a, an imperfect decision on that, that can still be taken into account in a pricing mechanism. Yeah. So that's I mean, good. All of our decisions are ultimately, sorry, Bella, I mean, yeah. as you know, from working with me, most of our decisions are imperfect on, on many levels. Um, but but that, that's really what it boils down to. There's no difference in kind of funding and traditional disputes at that point. I think the, what, you're, what you're touching on here is the relatively kind of nascent area for a funder, at least, going into the trust world um, and trying to get a degree of comfort, because there's no certainty, as to whether or not we are pricing those risks correctly. And only time will tell. Okay. Do you, I mean, as a crude question, because of the uncertainty, is this more expensive than a more mature market where you've got a, a greater understanding of the risks? Um, to an extent, yes. I mean, like, you know, it's the stock answer you're going to get from any funder is that pricing is reflective of risk. So, so to the extent the risk is higher, the pricing is obviously higher as well. Um, but actually, you know, it depends on the nature of the dispute. The, the trust disputes I've looked at are multi-jurisdictional in nature. And they incorporate common law jurisdictions, civil code jurisdictions. And so it's quite difficult to piecemeal together what you think is an accurate risk profile. Uh, but you, you do the best you can and you see where the pricing comes out. Okay, thanks. Now, that's all very interesting when you've got an asset that's going to come out at the end of the process. Um, trustees claiming an interest or claiming control of a trust fund. Um, it gets more complicated, though, where you say have discretionary beneficiaries who have claims to, uh, and the obvious one is, say, restitution of the trust fund or just removal of trustees, where these people are not going to be getting cash in their pocket, not going to be getting control of assets that they're going to be able to pay you out of. So, number one, uh, do you have problems with definitions of success in that situation? And number two, even if you have a definition of success, if there's no clearly identifiable sum of money which they're going to get, even if they win, how are you ever going to deal with that? Have you had any experience of how to deal with that situation? Um, yes, yes. It, and it's, it's tough for all the reasons you mentioned. So I think, you know, when we talk about more broadly, why do you not see more litigation finance in the context of the trust world? I think some of the things you just touched on are exactly the reason why. You know, the, the few circumstances that have crossed my desk where we're funding trustees are pretty unusual and quirky in their own way. I think what I would expect to see far more frequently is exactly the circumstance you just described. So discretionary beneficiary has an issue with the trustees. Can they get funding to, to help it? And I've seen this on quite a few occasions. But as you correctly touch on, really, it's a question of standing. Who is my contractual counterpart? So if my contractual counterparty is a funder, is a discretionary beneficiary, what is my recourse if we are successful? How do I get paid my money and my premium? And 
you know, if the trust is established or reconstituted in your example correctly, that commercial counterparty will not have legal title to the majority of the trust assets where I will have my recourse to my premium. And so when we've looked at this before, it's, it's a boring answer, but it's kind of very fact specific and very case by case. So we got quite close to funding a matter relatively recently that we had to pass on for other reasons where, you know, the discretionary beneficiary in question was very sensible, um, good, good potential client and was willing to grant us security over other assets he controlled irrespective of the, the main dispute they wanted funding for. So that was a, a scenario whereby we weren't entirely sure that the reconstitution of the trust, if successful, and a distribution by the new trustees to the beneficiary, allowing him to pay his premium, all of our eggs weren't in that particular basket. We knew we could be in a position whereby we could, you know, enforce security he was able to grant at the time. You know, one of the things we contemplated, and I, and I know... Gilead's going to jump in and save me in a second, but I know one of the things we, we contemplated was whether or not, whether it would be possible to try to essentially charge any potential future distributions once the trust was successfully reconstituted, if indeed that's what happened. Um, but like I say, we, we didn't get that far out of diligence because we didn't proceed on that particular investment, but it's something we're looking at. I mean, I think an overarching point I'd like to make is I, I'm not a fan of big data. When everyone says big data, I kind of glaze over and it's, it's awful. I shouldn't say that, I know. But, but we at Burford, because of our size and scale, we're fortunate that we've got a huge backlog of, of a decade long of history of looking at every single case we've invested in across all the different um, you know, areas of the law, litigation, arbitration. And we, we did an analysis a little while ago. And I think one of the more interesting patterns to come out of that was the credibility and sophistication of our commercial counterparty. So all of the things that you would normally think of a funder would be concerned about, you know, the economics, the merits of the case, the legal team, one of the really kind of strong impressions that was made on us looking at our 10 years worth of history is one of the biggest correlations between a successful resolution for Burford was the sophistication of our contractual counterparty. And I think that that's going to be true and hold true in, in the context of trust litigation as well. To the extent we start funding discretionary beneficiaries with trust disputes, providing we can get comfortable on the question of where do we get our return from, that's one of the things we'd be looking at. Because I think we know in, in this world, you sometimes have, you know, exotic and interesting characters involved. Um, you know, and so I think that would be one of the key determinants we'd be looking for, as well as the traditional, what are the merits of the case, what's the duration risk, what are the economics, et cetera. Okay, thanks. I, I usually, usually, usually use the term misunderstood entrepreneur for some of my clients, but I think exotic and interesting is going to be my next uh, euphemism. Um, the, the, the point you raised uh, as a practical point that you were thinking about in the middle of uh, assessing this potential beneficiary claim. Uh, can you secure yourself against discretionary uh, rights is something that actually that Gilead, uh, Gilead recently had to a degree in, in a related case in the Channel Islands. Gilead, um, can you tell us a little bit about how that how that worked out, uh, whether or not it's well, Channel Islands or, or more general common law jurisdiction? Yes. <clears throat> well, when we were when we were discussing amongst ourselves uh, before this session what we were going to talk about, um, Daniel mentioned uh, this case, recent case in Jersey, Keir and Watson. Um, uh, now, one of the problems of this whole area is that there's relatively little case law uh, to guide one. Um, and what struck me of, is that Keir and Watson, um, on its facts, had nothing to do with litigation funding. It was actually a case about uh, uh, attempting to enforce a judgment uh, against um, an established fraudster. Um, the judgment creditors had obtained a judgment worth something in excess of £45 million pounds in the UK and were trying to enforce it against uh, his assets um, in Jersey. And the particular asset they were trying to uh, attach um, was his interest as an object of a discretionary power under a trust that he's create, he'd created. 
Um, now, th there are a number of uh, things in background. I mean, th at that stage, at least, there, there's, there was no claim uh, to set aside or attack the validity of the trust. Um, and uh, what the judgment creditors were attempting to do was to use a particular Jersey form of relief, relief, um, an aret, uh, who sees uh, charge um, his discretionary interest. Uh, now, uh, conventional orthodox wisdom, certainly as a matter of uh, English law, uh, would say that is uh, clearly impossible. Uh, but because of the way the Jersey trust laws were uh, framed, uh, they were able to put together uh, an argument for saying that um, uh, a beneficial interest included uh, such a, uh, an interest as a potential beneficiary. And so the case did throw up precisely the, the kind of question that Daniel was talking about a moment ago. Um, in the result, uh, the court held... Uh, I think, uh, perfectly, in a perfectly orthodox way, uh, that there was no interest capable of being attached, um, just in the same way as uh, a trustee in bankruptcy would have no uh, interest um, and indeed nothing to sell. Uh, so uh, a charge would have no effect, uh, even if granted. Um, there was a secondary problem with it, which not only is an interest is to be considered as a potential object of discretionary trust, not a property right. Um, uh, it's also something that would put the trustees in uh, potential difficulty uh, when they came to exercise a, a par, because if uh, the effect of making a distribution to that discretionary beneficiary was, to their knowledge, simply going to transfer everything to his uh, trust creditors for no benefit, with no benefit to him, then that exercise would be a, a fraud on the par. Um, and so it's quite difficult to see what benefit uh, on a ret, even if it had been granted, would have given the, uh, the claimants in that case. Okay, so that's really interesting. If you secure yourself over an asset, then, you pro then you're prohibiting indirectly the trustees from exercising their power in, your, in the discretionary beneficiary's favor because it's a fraud on the power. And I can see the logic behind that. But it does raise that next question, <clears throat> which is short of attaching to discretionary interests, and, and the fact that it's not allowed is probably a good idea, but short of doing that, is there anything that can be gained from the trustee side, whether uh, whether positively from the trustees encouraging this to happen or from the beneficiary slash funders side encouraging the trustees to do something? And I'm talking about situations here playing more nicely. Uh, can you encourage them to give indications of what they might do? Can you uh, get some sort of contingent but future contingent uh, application of a power of appointment without binding themselves or possibly with binding themselves. Um, do you have any sort of experience of that or any concepts of that? I mean, it's a new field, so it may be quite difficult to come up with a positive answer to that. Was that for me, Fenner? That was, no, that was for Gilead, actually. No, oh, I, thought, I, thought, I thought that was for, for, for Daniel because, uh, uh, <clears throat> again, in our, our, our pre-session discussions, uh, uh, you came up with a rather interesting and I thought amusing idea of a kind of sword of Damocles, uh, whereby the, the uh, putative beneficiary uh, gives some sort of um, security out of his own assets, such that if the trustee does not exercise his discretion, its discretion in the beneficiary's favor, uh, uh, all hell is going to break loose for the, for the beneficiary. <laughs> Uh, uh, um, yeah, this is one of the uh, I've made it sound a bit like blackmail, but um, uh, perhaps you could you could cast it. Thank you for that kind introduction, light. Gilead. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> you've obviously seen my press profile. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, one of the things we contemplated in the in the case we looked at where we might be funding a discretionary beneficiary, you know, we were you know the the challenge we had there was one of timing. So. In a normal circumstance, it would be easier contractually to have a funding arrangement with the trustees, much like I put in my other cases. Um, the challenge is the remedy that discretionary beneficiary was seeking was the reconstitution of the trust. So 
I cannot enter into an LFA with the discretion beneficiary, fund the, the pending claim, prevail, and then essentially seek my contractual recourse against a trustee installed at that point. And so the concern is, and again, based on the experience, and I'm sure we've all had, but particularly we've had with, with trustees in these disputes is, they obviously have a duty to look after the, the, the corpus and the beneficiary group, but there's, no, there's an element of protecting their own backsides as well. And so one of the challenges we had was thinking, okay, well, if we were to get sufficient security against a discretion beneficiary, and later on the trust is uh, reconstituted, um, and then the trustees turn around and say, no, oh, we don't want to pay. Sorry, uh, tough luck. We don't have a deal with you. And actually it's detrimental to the remaining class of the beneficiaries if we pay a funder some huge premium. One of the things we were contemplating is whether or not taking essentially action against our contractual counterparty, our discretion beneficiary, to put him or her in a position where the trustees felt compelled to rise to his or her rescue and make a distribution from the trust to pay our premium would be so you're talking about worth. kidnapping his puppy pretty much yeah exactly um and well and then drowning um yeah. but because of that kind of pretty unattractive set of optics is one of the reasons we chose to pass on it and i think frankly one of the reasons why finding a way of structuring a funding arrangement for a discretionary beneficiary is so challenging you know we want to we don't always achieve this lofty goal but the idea is at the end of most of our cases to walk away um, with a degree of kind of happiness on both sides from client side and funder side and i i think we want to steer clear of, of scenarios like that where, where problems could occur strangely people try to avoid drowning puppies as part of their general practice of business but thank you thank you very much for all of that that was absolutely fascinating um i imagine that we're going to have a bunch of questions about this in practical practical terms at the end of the session but we've got to move on quite quickly we've got a handful of things to quickly cover uh, it's the end of the day, so these are really short, and they're really just intended to flag up some, some points that we've been discussing amongst ourselves that you might not have come across before. First point I'm going to very quickly go through with Gilead is constructive trustees and constructive trustees and costs. Are they entitled to their costs like an express trustee or indeed at all? And, and, and your basic starting point on this is CPR part 46.3, which, which is the bit of the CPR that gives you the general rule about a trustee being entitled to their costs out of the trust fund. The problem is it doesn't say whether or not it applies to constructive trustees, and there's no definition in the glossary of the CPR as to what a trustee is. There is a case, Allsop and Wilkinson, uh, Allsop Wilkinson against Neary, where Mr. Justice Lyman said that constructive trustees were entitled to their costs like express trustees, at least as far as administering the trust is concerned. But, but can that be right? Does 46.3 cover constructive trustees? Gilead, I know that you've got some quite trenchant views about this. <laughs> well, um, I, I think what um, Mr. Justice Lightman had in mind, and um, it, it, what occurred in Allsop Wilkinson Neary, is the situation where an express trust has been set up and is then subject to a challenge on the grounds that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the settler didn't have the necessary power or it was, an, it was an attempt to defraud creditors or something of that sort. Uh, so you have someone who is holding assets, they acknowledge the fact that they hold them as trustees for one side or the other, uh, but they are in genuine doubt as to whether they hold them under the terms of the express trust or whether they hold them as resulting trustees for the claimant. And one can see that in those circumstances, provided they act reasonably and neutrally and, and um, uh, uh, properly in the interests of protecting those assets, there should be no reason why they don't, uh, why they shouldn't be entitled to recover their costs, even if in, if in the event it turns out that, it's, that the express trust is invalid, so they can't rely on any contractual provisions, uh, that they should be entitled to their costs. Uh, but I don't imagine for a minute that uh, Mr. Justice Lightman can have had in mind uh, people who are uh, accused of being constructive trustees on the grounds that they knowingly assisted a breach of trust uh, or in knowing receipt of trust assets. Uh, 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 and it would be, um, I think, uh, quite a courageous constructive trustee in those circumstances uh, who, who asked the judge to uh, make an award for costs out of the trust funds in, in, in his favour. Yeah, so that's, that's fair enough. Obviously, if you're if you're disputing whether or not you're actually a constructive trustee, I see the entire point. 
Uh, that's not so much administration of trust. Um, a slightly more extreme, peculiar, but not unique case is where you are a naughty constructive trustee, to use a slightly, ter slightly slack term. Uh, but you're doing what any trustee would have to do. You're protecting the trust assets. And we're not talking from claims about whether it's held on trust. I'm talking about protecting it, maintaining the building, uh, protecting it from trespass claims. Um, surely in those situations, if a genuine trustee would be entitled to their costs out of the trust fund, why is there a reason why the constructive trustees wouldn't be entitled to their costs? Well, I, I, I don't think they would. Um, uh, uh, they are acting not in the interests of protecting the beneficiaries, they are spending money in the interests of uh, uh, perpetuating and enjoying the benefits of the, um, the fraud or whatever it was uh, that they are being held uh, party to. Um, so I would be very surprised if in those circumstances uh, they were entitled to say, ah, oh, well, uh, e even if someone had been acting for the interests of the true beneficiaries, uh, they would have had to spend these, th this money. So why shouldn't we get our costs? Um, uh, good luck with that one, I'd say. Thanks very much, Gilead. Um, Last couple of points uh, we're gonna deal with in about four minutes. Uh, and, and this is a practical point and something that uh, Jamie and I have come up with uh, on a practical, we don't think that many people are aware of this. The first point is patients and minors. Um, <clears throat> how do you deal with the costs of patients and minors? And, and, and as Michael Kane would say, not a lot of people know about this, that the litigation costs of protected persons, so patients and minors. Jamie, what's the rule here? So the point we wanted to highlight comes out of CPR 46.4, where there's a general rule that where costs are ordered to be paid by or out of money belonging to a protected party, the court must order a detailed assessment. Uh, and when it does so, it must also assess any costs payable to the protected party. And then the, the related rule we wanted to consider as well is CPR 21.12 which provides that a litigation friend who incurs expenses on behalf of a protected party is also going to need a Rule 46.4 assessment in certain circumstances if they want to recover those expenses from the protected party. So the, the point we wanted to highlight is that you may need a detailed assessment. Oh dear, Fenner is now on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jamie. That's very embarrassing. Okay, so that's great. You may need a detailed assessment. Here's the practical problem. Who assesses these costs? How is it going to work in practice? Is it the other side? Absolutely. I mean, you may have had a piece of litigation that until now has been entirely non-adversarial and, and a detailed cost assessment is, in theory, or generally, potentially quite an adversarial process. And so I think the two points we wanted to highlight is, one, be aware that there is this general rule, and secondly, be proactive ahead of the hearing of which the substantive issue, whatever it may be that you're trying to resolve, is going to be determined by the court. And, uh, and at that hearing, try and rely on one of the exceptions set out in CPR 46 and in its practice direction. And I, I won't go into the details of those, but some of those provide for a summary assessment. And if you can't do that, make sure you get a process set out in your order when you're dealing with the substantive issue of, of who is going to uh, put the other side of the argument for the court, who's going to serve, be served with the bill of costs and uh, how you're going to deal with that process, sort of costs of costs, is, are the costs gonna be provided for in any event for the person who's putting up the other side of the argument? And, and I think the final point Fenner and I had occurred to I was, was query if you get rid of the usual 20% rule so that uh, in an adversarial uh, um, detailed cost assessment, you have the general rule that if you manage to knock 20% off a bill in your challenge, you've won, so you get the costs of your costs, the sub-cost process. Whereas if you fail to knock off 20%, then the, the respondent has won. And, and to sort of preserve the position we were talking about before, you might, you might get rid of that rule. So it's a more, a more neutral, non-adversarial process. Thanks for that. And, and, and that assessment process flows through to our second area, which is, which is better proceedings. And this is something that, that both of us have have experienced in the last year or two, which is that Beto court judges are getting more alive to the issue of costs, not in terms of challenging cost bills or, or cost, cost predictions, but about how you deal with them in practice. So uh, Jamie, can you uh, expand on this? 
Absolutely. And, and we, we see this as, as a bit of a potential opportunity where, where the judge says, well, I'm not, sort of, I'm not disagreeing with your estimate. Uh, that sounds reasonable to me. But what happens, uh, please tell me, if, if you exceed that, are you going to have to come back in front of me and, and make another application? And it seems to us that a potential answer to that, as well as possibly also dealing with the inherent difficulty of getting these estimates right at the outset, um, is to set up a process whereby you have one of the beneficiaries appointed under the order to regularly assess the costs of the parties going forwards. Uh, and this also has the advantage that if you've got, uh, say in, a, in a, a classic family trust dispute, you've got eight sensible beneficiaries and one black sheep who's objecting to absolutely everything, here's your chance to anticipate them in advance and set up a process that's going to stop them later trying to veto your cost bill or, or cause a huge amount of difficulty with that. Yeah. Yeah, no, so the experience that I kicked off in was, was pensions litigation where no one beneficiary is ever going to look at it in detail, but actually the court sets up a process where a rep Ben deals with this. But the, I strongly suspect that as this gets more familiar with the judges, it's going to be a great way of keeping mad cousin Johnny out of the process where they can spend six months sending letters and just racking up costs because they are insane and can do this and they hate you. So uh, hopefully that will give us a practical answer. Now, it is just after 6.15 when we're running out of time. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I've got one that's come through on the uh, private chat, or so, so to speak, asking for anonymity, um, which is uh, in relation to the first issue. But if anybody's got any questions about this, pop it through on the chat system. And actually, I've got two that have come through on the private chat. That's very impressive. Uh, I'm going to take the short one. Are the courts getting more into challenging Beddow costs assessments? And, and I'll, I'll assume by that they mean Beddow cost predictions. Uh, Jamie, personal experience? Uh, our, just to put this in context, as I can see that us our having raised this point might have uh, given rise to that impression, that, that isn't our experience, no. Uh, it, it's not that their judges are necessarily taking a more demanding approach to those estimates or are becoming more hostile to their use and saying, well, I just want to cap these costs uh, or, or something like that, or you're only gonna get this much. The point was more that judges are starting to, if anything, be a bit more thoughtful and proactive, possibly because they're being provided with cost budgets in, in other areas of litigation and asking questions such as, well, what, I assume this is all going rather well right now. I'm, I'm happy with everything you're saying, but what happens if something goes wrong later? How can I help me deal with this potential practical problem? And that was more where we were coming from. I don't know if you've had a different experience, Benna. No, no, I, I, it, it's not the predictions. It's the how are we going to deal with it in practice? And I think that the judges are more aware of the fact that it's nice giving a prediction, but it's bloody useless if nobody is going to have a way of enforcing that or challenging it if it turns out to be wildly off the, off the reservation. Uh, with that, and I'm going to close off any further questions coming in. I'm going to have to sorry, say apologise to the other person who asked a question on private chat. I'm going to hand it back to Andrew uh, to close off the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bennett, and thanks to all the panel members, especially to our guest, Dan. Well, that concludes our two panel sessions. I hope you found them interesting and a source of food for thought. Thank you to everyone for attending. I saw we had well over 200 attendees at the peak. For anyone who missed part of today's webinar, we will be uploading the recording to our YouTube channel later in the week. Just search Wilberforce Chambers on YouTube and you'll find us. And now we move on to the hugely exciting virtual networking part of the event. This will take place in breakout rooms controlled by our marketing team. 